this second um, talk is uh, autism spectrum disorder, autism in, in genetic disorders. And I'll just start by saying I'm not an autism specialist. I'm not an autism expert. I haven't specifically trained in autism, but have come to become very interested in autism via the genetic syndromes. And I think there's a very important question here that where you can say in genetic disorders, are the social problems that we see autism or not? And it feels like a very straightforward question, <laughs> actually quite a complicated one, but very interesting and, and exciting one, I think. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm not coming down either way on that debate, let me say that right at the outset. Um, but I just want to introduce some of the ideas um, and some of the problems and some of the very difficult problems that we have to start thinking about now, I think. So the structure of the talk is, is here. Um, so I will talk a bit about estimates of prevalence, and I'll use the term probably autism spectrum disorder, autism interchangeably. I know I shouldn't, but uh, I just will. Um, and I'll speak a bit about um, profiles of domains, differences within domains. Then I just want to speak about some causal pathways, um, then something about other differences that are, are really interesting. And then, most interestingly, something about developmental trajectories, how things change over time. So that's what I'm going to do. So, um, so let me just show you the, some prevalence data. So here we've used the ASQ, SCQ. So these are screening questionnaires, which we have sent to parents, and parents have completed these. These are sample sizes ranging from um, anything from 26 people only in... Uh, Kleefstra syndrome or 1P36, 8P23, right up to around 250 people in Fragile X, Prada Willy, Cornelia de Lang. Um, and I think one of the things when you just, uh, just to orient you then, so this is the um, autism spectrum disorder in grey and then the higher threshold for autism in, um, in dark, uh, darker blacky grey. Um, Fragile X, at this end, down at this end, Down syndrome. And I think that gives us a very useful reference group. So we see, um, it, it was argued that you rarely see uh, autism in Down syndrome. Actually, it runs at about 8%. That's comparatively low, but it is actually quite high, given um, population prevalences. Um, but it gives us an anchor point of a, a very well-known syndrome, if, if you know what I mean, that, by which we can look at the other syndromes. And our estimates are very similar to estimates from a number of other studies using a number of different methods um, for some of the syndromes. And so it gives us some confidence in the estimates for um, other syndromes. And the first thing to notice is the variability. So quite clearly, this is not due to the associated intellectual disability in the genetic disorder. Otherwise, it, these would correlate with degree of disability. So in the most disabled group, for example, Angelman syndrome, we would expect to see very, very high levels, um, and we don't. And so this clearly isn't a function of intellectual disability. It is related to something else. So this variability, the point at this stage to make, I think, is there is variability. It's not intellectual disability. Um, and I make no comment at all about whether this is autism or not. All you can say is this is what people score on these measures. And that's our starting point in trying to address the question of is, there all, is this autism? We could go a completely different route into this question. But let's just start from there and try and work our way through phenomenology and into, into models. So the next question we can ask is, if we take, and here I'm still using the triad of impairments, of social impairment, communication impairment, restricted behavior and, and repetitive, uh, restricted interest and repetitive behavior. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the triad. I'm aware that DSM-5 has changed this to a dyad, introduced sensory uh, interest. But I'll, I'll continue to talk about the triad just for the time being. So the next question we can ask is this. If you take the triad of impairments, does each component of the triad contribute to the overall, um, if you like, cutoff for autism or autism spectrum disorder in the same way across 
different syndromes. So it's ever so difficult to, um, to draw up com comparative data. So what we've done is say, well, let's just compare each syndrome with each other syndrome and say whether or not they score higher or lower than another syndrome. So if you have um, a score of one, a one plus, it means higher than one other syndrome. So what our strategy has been to position the syndromes relative to each other, because I don't know what would be the other contrast group. If it's heterogeneous intellectual disability, all you're doing is putting lots of syndromes together, and that's sloppy. So we've decided to, to adopt this strategy, rightly or wrongly. But let's just highlight two of these, because the percentage of people reaching cutoff for ASD and autism is almost identical in these syndromes. It's almost identical. So they're a useful comparator. And then as we run our eye across, what we see is that the profile, what's contributing to the overall level is different in the different syndromes. In other words, there's different drivers, probably, to a diagnosis of autism in different syndromes. And you can see this in, and the interesting example for me has always been smith mcginnis syndrome, where people talk about Parents will talk about, well, he, he has got autistic characteristics. And I think what they're referring to is the repetitive behaviors. And the same is true in Prada Willy. P parents will be uh, strong advocates for the diagnosis of autism. I'll come back to this much later on. But I think what drives that is not the social communicative impairments that are qualitatively similar to non-syndromic idiopathic autism, but it's often the repetitive behavior that drives this. Maybe true in Cornelia Delang as well. But here, just at the domain level, different components of the triad contribute, but that also alludes to underlying mechanism, where it may be that there is dissociation or fragmentation of the triad, suggesting that different mechanisms drive different components of the triad, and that's theoretically interesting. So we've looked at different domains in the triad. Let's look within a domain now, within one domain, and say, do items contribute in the same way to that domain score? It's, it's a busy graph, I know, but this is comparing people with um, idiopathic autism spectrum disorder and people with Cornelia de Lange syndrome. And the people with Cornelia de Lange syndrome have tripped the threshold for autism spectrum disorder. So they, they're, they're comparable in their overall tripping the cutoff. And then we ask the question, do all of the items contribute in the same way? And the answer is they don't. So in um, Cornelia de Lange, you see, we rarely see odd or stereotype phrases. This might be correlated with poor language use and production anyway, but you rarely, even in more able people, I don't think I've ever heard echolalia, for example, or stereotype phrases. Um, even in people who appear to have other autistic um, phenomenology. This is very interesting. Eye contact in Cornelia de Lange appears to me to be unimpaired, even when all of the other autistic characteristics are there. And we see this, we've done this in a number of studies where we've had um, undergraduates naive to the experiment, watching children during ADOS, coding their eye contact. And we've even coded second-by-second second sequences on shared attention. Do the children point and look in the right way? And do they then look at the adult? And they do. So this is interesting that it seems to be intact. Um, but in autism spectrum disorder, clearly that's um, compromised. And then sensory interests. And this is of interest because DSM-5 highlights sensory interests. We do not see these. Again, I've rarely seen these in Cornelia de Lange syndrome very common in autism. Now, in, it, this is an interesting debate because it may well be when we have assessed peripheral nerve function in Cornelia de Lange syndrome, there's a delay in nerve transmission. Now, it may well be then that there is sensory impairment in Cornelia de Lange syndrome, and that may account for less sensory interests, and thus the children are hampered by a physical difference in tripping the diagnosis for autism. And I think that's an interesting problem. But we don't necessarily see those. And again, gestures 
in Cornelia Delang syndrome are not as impaired as in autism spectrum disorder. In all of the other areas, things are very, very similar, except for anxiety and social anxiety in particular. And that is much more common in Cornelia de Lange than autism. And that may be what leads us to see children with Cornelia de Lange and think there are strong autistic characteristics. And it's not because they are indifferent to social engagement. It's that they are anxious about social engagement. And there may be a completely different cause of that that I'll come to. But at this stage, I just want to show that when you take a group of people with non-syndromic idiopathic autism, compare them to a group of people with a genetic disorder who trip the cutoff for autism spectrum disorder, even if they uh, trip the cutoff in the domains, the different items that are contributing are different. So the profile is different. This is just another example. I showed this yesterday. It's about in um, Angelman syndrome, I mentioned a very strong drive for eye contact. So you can see this girl interacting with two of our research team, and she clearly seeks out eye contact. Now, if you were doing an ADOS with someone with Angelman syndrome who wanted your eye contact all the time, and you run the shared attention test, the bubble gun, for example, where what the child should do is you shoot the bubble gun, and then the child should look at you, look at the bubble gum, and look at you again. And that would show shared attention. That triad shows a shared attention, and that would mean that uh, it's not impaired on autism. But if I want eye contact all the time, I'm not going to look at the gum. In other words, it's my motivation to seek the eye contact would lead me to fail on an item on the ADOS, but not because I lack shared attention necessarily, but because... I have high motivation for the eye contact. And finally, I've already shown this in smith mcginnis syndrome. Again, you may trip unusual social items on the ADOS or uh, on the SCQ, for example, because of this strong attachment to the parent. So I'm just raising the possibility that um, even if you do trip the same item, you might do it for a different reason. And that's an interesting difference, I think. Let's just stay within domains. Okay, so you need to trip the threshold, for example, for repetitive behavior and restricted interests. When we look across the syndromes, do you do that for the same reason? So here, what's important here is not, um, is not what these behaviors are, but these are stereotype behaviors. Um, these are um, interests in single objects, tidying, hoarding, organizing rituals, lying in, up, completing, and these are the verbal items. And what's important here is just this pattern. So that's the pattern for people with autism. Now let's put the pattern up for people with different syndromes. So the first thing you see, um, so there's the autism group. And the first thing you see when you look around, Angelman's, Low Syndromes, Cornelia de Lange, Fragile X, Prada Willy, Smith McGuinness, Cree de Chat, uh, Heterogeneous Intellectual Disability Group. But as soon as you look around, you just see a different profile across the different groups. And that seems to me really very important because what's driving the uh, tripping that domain score is different in different groups and is certainly different in most cases from autism spectrum disorder, except in Cornelia de Lange Fragile X, they appear to be reasonably similar. And one of the things that really differs is this bottom bit. These are the more sophisticated repetitive behaviors like rituals, arranging, uh, hoarding, and so on. And you can see them completely absent, for example, in Cree de Chat. Um, and the patterns generally are fairly similar, but there are some differences. There's the lack of the verbal um, echolalia phrases questions in Cornelia de Lange, and a slightly different profile again in Fragile X, repetitive questioning a bit more prominent. And what's interesting in these, I think, is syndromes like Angelman syndrome, where you simply rarely see 
these lining up, organizing, and so on. And you're mainly seeing just the stereotype behaviors. Now, some of those stereotype behaviors, I don't think, are similar to the stereotype behaviors you see in autism necessarily. We don't see rocking, for example, or strobing in Angelman syndrome. What you see is at times of pleasure, hand flapping. It's a very characteristic uh, movement. And so the, the, the point from this is that there may be different drivers. And these are the syndromes that I think are incredibly interesting. Um, so here, I've mentioned prada willi And here you can see um, the repetitive questioning, the adherence to routine. This is hoarding down the bottom that sticks out. And you'll know that in prada willi syndrome. And then over here in creda Schaff syndrome, there's that characteristic attachment to objects. And so it's usually one type of object. It will last for a while, and then it transfers to a different object. It's very different than um, autism, where it may be the same type of object, the same type, uh, collecting something of the same type. And the question we should have is, is why is there this uneven profile? Why don't the repetitive behaviors all come together? Because if they don't, then it means there's a different mechanism. And that may again lead us to looking at different um, drivers of executive function, different cognitive domains. So I've mentioned um, some differences that we can see in overall profile. I'll mention now and um, possible differences in causal pathways. Um, and this is a bit speculative from us, I think. Um, but I, th I think there's something interesting in trying to think about um, whether what drives the overall social impairment are impairments of executive function or whether there might be impairments of social cognition and whether we separate those, those out. And then secondly, something about social information processing. So some of this I showed yesterday. But I want to show you here a strategy um, that we've adopted to try and look at the development of theory of mind um, in the different syndromes. So theory of mind, as you know, is a, is a core component, a core deficit in people with autism spectrum disorder. And one of the things we've tried to do is develop a social cognition battery because arguably there are precursors to theory of mind. So in young children, if you set up this kind of task, this is Laurie Powers who developed this battery, um, whereby you drop something, you deliberately drop something onto the floor, um, a typically developing child of around 14 months will usually pick that up for you. And that means that that child understands helping. They understand that you are trying to reach the pencil and they will help. So it's not full-blown theory of mind, but it understands intention. And that seems quite important. It's there very, very early on, way back at 14 months. And then there are some other um, behaviors that unfold, communicative pointing, communicative gaze, and then cooperation tasks. So one of these tasks, you have a very long tube. You're trying to open the tube to get at the toy inside, but you need two people to do it. You have to get on either end. It's too big. And so you just hold on to one end of the tube, and then a typically developing child of around 24 months will zip around the other end, get hold, and pull with you. The cooperation. And then after that, we see the typical theory of mind, and you'll know these tasks. And what you have to do here is suppress your own knowledge um, in order to think in the way that someone else is thinking. And that's a much more sophisticated task. So this is about social cognition and the way it unfolds, knowing about the social world, knowing about someone else's perspective. And so the question is, in, Prada, in rubenstein taby syndrome, does this unfold, unfold in the way that we would expect it to? And so this is what happens. So these are the tasks from 14 months through to full theory of mind. These are different participants. And what's happening is you can see it, broadly speaking, it, it scales. In other words, if you've got the early ones, 
sorry, if you've got the later ones, the theory of mind, then you've usually got these earlier ones as well. So this does seem to unfold in rubenstein toby syndrome in the way that we would expect it to. But there's something really interesting in the syndrome, which is this, that although people tended to succeed on the early tasks, they hit a bit of a threshold. So what you can see here is these are individual participants, and these are um, their mental age equivalent. So some participants had a higher mental age than other participants. And what we expected to find was that the theory of mind tasks would unfold in the same way. In other words, they would be able to do the early tasks if they had lower mental age. And the more sophisticated tasks, these should increase. But it plateaued. And it plateaued almost exactly around the theory of mind development. So what appeared to happen in rubenstein toby syndrome is the early helping tasks are all intact. They understand intent. They will cooperate. In that way, they understand the social situation. But when you get to the theory of mind tasks, they started to fail. Now, the important thing here is that at that level of theory of mind, that correlated highly with executive function, but not mental age. In other words, it was poor inhibition, poor work in memory, and poor attention shift that was driving this. And the point here is that whilst the social motivation is intact, actually theory of mind is compromised, but not because there is, if you like, impaired social cognition. It's managing the cognitive aspects of theory of mind that's driving that. So it may be that we see some of the social difficulties in this syndrome because of this EF type impairment rather than a social impairment. I want to give you a clinical example of this. So we've met um, a young woman with um, rubenstein toby syndrome. And in many of the children, many of the young adults, they'll be very sociable, very engaging, very keen to have friendships and relationships. Very, very important. It's a strong drive. What happened to this young woman is that at her workplace, she was being exploited by other people there. She would hand over all of her salary. She would always buy people drinks and gifts and dry food as soon as she had been paid, and then she had no money. So she was socially exploited. Now, what we think, one interpretation of that is that she is socially motivated to be cooperative, to help, to engage socially, but the theory of mind, the reading other people's intention, is a problem for her. So she could not understand that other people's intention were not good, that they were befriending her in order to um, take her money rather than being able to form a social relationship. That's a very sad story, but I think it shows um, that you can dissociate what we thought of as a core autism construct theory of mind from social motivation more, more generally. I mentioned this yesterday. So um, another explanation for why you have social differences might be differences in social information processing. Um, and social development is, is very dependent on attending to social stimuli. And as I mentioned, um, reading social cues. We do a lot of this through eye contact and reading other people's um, facial expressions, but particularly there's a lot of information from, from the eyes. And so we've been looking at, um, and, and one of the advantages here is you can use eye tracking technology. And what this allows you to do is use a very implicit task. So you don't have to give people instruction, as in theory of mind, or in the ADOS, it's not a behavioral um, performance task. This is a, a very implicit task where you simply show social situations, and then you can see where people are looking. So this is uh, um, a, a scene, social scene, and on here you can see where people with autism spectrum disorder are looking, and they're picking out little bits of detail of the social scene. Uh, and this is someone of typical development 
and you can see that they are, uh, when you just flash this image up and ask them to look at it, the hot spots, the red hot spots, are around the face and in particular the eyes. So here there's a clear difference in where people are looking. And importantly, um, we've been able to do this with people um, who only need to understand the instruction to be able to look through the eye tracker. You don't have to give complicated instructions. And so um, here's another example. Again, I showed this yesterday. But this is um, where people look at this social scene. People of typical development. Um, and here is where people with autism spectrum disorder look. So you can see very, very different patterns in, in what people are doing. So we've, in one experiment, we've shown people um, different types of social video. So in one video, somebody is approaching, and in another video, someone is just, just moving by you. And then we can match these with non-social videos uh, that have equal complexity. And then the question becomes, where do people look when you see these different pictures, or you see these videos? So what's interesting here is that if you take the groups Fragile X, Cornelia de Lange, Rubenstein, Toby, is that all of the groups um, look more at the socially directed than the non-socially directed. And they are, um, so in other words, when the person is coming towards you, you spend more time looking at that than if someone is, is walking beside you. Um, and everyone is looking at the social task. So that suggests that in these three groups, Fragile X, Rubenstein, Toby, Cornelia de Lange, People have the same level of social interest. And I think that's interesting in the Fragile X group, very high levels of autism spectrum disorder, um, or scoring high on the SEQ, and the RTS group, where you don't see those high levels. But what's interesting is in the Cornelia de Lange group, in that social approach, they take a very long time to pick that up. This is the time it takes them to search the scene and pick the person up as coming towards them. So in that group, they have a very different um, style, if you like, of social information processing, that they aren't picking up a social cue very early on. It takes them longer to pick that up as a social situation, whereas the other groups, again, the Fragile X group, will look very, very quickly. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting, and again, I showed this yesterday, is, is if you just show facial images to the three groups, it's here, the Fragile X group, are not looking at the eyes. And, it, and behaviorally, of course, this is something that people will recognize when you meet someone with Fragile X, is that eye gaze um, avoidance. Um, so the group is spending significantly less time looking at the eyes. But interestingly, the time taken by the three groups to fixate on the eyes is exactly the same. So what people with Fragile X are doing is they look at the eyes, then they look away very, very quickly. But they do go there first, the same as other people. And I think that's really interesting that they have the same kind of, it sort of suggests to me that many people will have the same social motivation, but then... Um, there may be an aversion to eye gaze that make people look away. But the impact of that um, may be that then, in the social interaction, that people with Fragile X are not getting as much social information back from the eye contact that other groups can. So that's a very long-winded explanation. But I'm trying to show that, in this case, an aversion to eye gaze may lead to a social difference that may look like autism spectrum disorder or may lead to social differences or problems that look like autism spectrum disorder. But what's behind them is eye gaze aversion that is highly specific. And I think that shows us that there may be different routes into the different social profiles. So I think I've shown you some different pathways, some different phenomenology. What is it that people see? This is, I think, really important when parents say um, he's got autistic characteristics. What is it that people actually pick up? And so this is, uh, again, the different syndrome groups. 
And this is selective mutism in the groups. Um, so this is the phenomenon, very common in Cornelia de Lange syndrome, of where people will speak in one environment but not another, or they will have very set rules about who they will speak to. And in Cornelia de Lange syndrome, we see this in about 40% of verbal people. So this is very, very common. And I think it's this that seems to um, make people think that there's an autism spectrum disorder type phenomenon. But I think it's much more driven by social anxiety. And what's interesting about this is that it emerges with age. It's not necessarily there in the younger children. So um, these are parents of a young man we've known for a number of years, Craig. And at 16 years old, they'll say, he's content to just sit there until he's asked a question. So he won't initiate contact, but he will respond. Um, he's quieter than he used to be. From one to four, he was very sociable. And we've seen this in a number of the children. They're very sociable early on. But as they come into their early teen years, that drops away and the selective mutism starts to emerge. Um, and this is important, but um, it does take time for people to answer. And we've seen this in a number of our studies. And it made us start to think, that actually it's not a, an unwillingness to take part in the social interaction. There's something about processing time and probably executive function, we think, that's slowing people down and making social interaction more difficult to be part of. And I'll just pursue this in the developmental trajectory of autism. So the point here is that often, um, particularly in more able people with autism, we see the symptoms and the behavioral characteristics soften with age. But there is a question about whether that's true in the different syndromes. So if I show you um, Cornelia de Lange and Fragile X again, what's important here is in Fragile X, we can often see the symptomatology. This is scores on the SCQ going down under 16, 16 to 21. But the scores in Cornelia de Lange are increasing. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's autism, but scores on the SEQ are undoubtedly going up. So it, when we talk about autism with parents, I think it's important for us to know the trajectories because they may be very different across the different syndromes. If I just show you some other trajectories. So these are, this is just sociability. And this is the sociability to interact with, on the right-hand side, unfamiliar people. And just see how different it is. So when you look at smith mcginnis in the purple, it increases into adulthood. But in Angelman syndrome, it's coming down. Um, so there are different patterns with age. Uh, these patterns are almost identical, but the starting point is different. So in Angelman syndrome versus Cornelia de Lange, uh, there is the same trajectory, but different starting points. And this is the critical point, is that if we arbitrarily think of this level of sociability of being atypically strong and atypically low, you can see the Angelman group drift from an atypically strong profile to a typical or normal profile where for Cornelia de Lange, it's different and it drifts into atypicality. And that's, um, I think that's interesting that you've got the same mechanism perhaps driving a developmental trajectory, but the consequence of where you start out is different for you over time. I'll just finish on this um, example because it, it's a little bit complicated, but really important, I think. So again, this is Cornelia de Lange, and we're interested in this impaired sociability. So we compare people, Cornelia de Lange and a group of people with Down syndrome, and we involve them in a social situation. And the social situation is done both with familiar and unfamiliar people. And you can see the Cornelia de Lange group are finding the unfamiliar people much more difficult, and they will not speak as much. These are matched for verbal ability, absolutely comparable for verbal ability and adaptive behavior. 
Um, and also, we increase the demand. So as you're moving across the bottom here, um, there is more demand um, for people to participate in the interaction. You can see people with Down syndrome responding and speaking more, but that isn't true for people with Cornelia Delang. They're finding it much more difficult. What we then did is say, how much you speak in those situations, is that correlated with your SCQ score, your autism score? And the answer was no, it wasn't. But what it did correlate with was executive function, cognitive process. And down here, this is um, inhibition subscale from the brief. This is work in memory. And this, is, this one, I think, is the most important. Planning and organizing, being able to plan ahead. And these, in Cornelia Delang, correlated and predicted how much the person spoke but that wasn't true in Down syndrome. So just to summarize this, what we think is happening is that in Cornelia Delang, I showed you early on that the eye contact appears intact, there's gesturing, but um, there's limited speech. Now, you could think that that's emerging or stronger autism spectrum disorder or it might be driven by executive function, and it looks like it's driven by executive function. And this, I think, is the critical bit. These two, working memory and planning and organizing. If you imagine speaking to a stranger in a social situation, that's one of the most unpredictable situations you are ever in. You don't know what's about to happen, what's about to be said. You need your working memory in order to remember what's been said so that you can respond. You need to be able to plan and organize what you're about to say. If you can't do that, that's a very confusing situation. It's a difficult situation. And even in typical development, these EF impairments are correlated with selective mutism. So one of the ways that you may manage that situation is you may simply not speak, because then people will not ask you more questions. And the other important thing is that when we correlated these two with age in Cornelia Delang syndrome, they decrease with age. And that surprised us in one way um, because we hadn't seen this in any other syndrome except late on in Down syndrome. But what we saw was a decline in working memory and this um, planning, organizing in Cornelia de Lange with age. So something is changing in Cornelia de Lange syndrome, probably in the early teens and then on into the 20s. And the poster out there describes this very well of an increase in insistence on sameness. People become much more anxious about anything that's unpredictable and will often then refuse to go into social situations, refuse to go to day centers, simply because they find that so anxiety-provoking and will shut down. What we found is at that point that often autism spectrum disorder services are actually very good for people because they're highly organized. There's often very low social demand. They're very predictable. Okay, I'm aware that um, close to time, and <laughs> perhaps this isn't the right question to ask at this point, otherwise you wouldn't have had to sit through all this, but does it matter? And I do think this is a really important question. At one of the meetings that we go to, the Society for the Study of Behavioral Phenotypes, every year there's a bit of a debate, is it autism? <laughs> should, we, should we use the term autism? And I just want to say something about that. So we could be pragmatists, and we could say, look, the behavior's cut the threshold, it's autism. It's behaviorally defined, it's autism. Um, and... The reason we may do that is that at a pragmatic level, it helps people understand the social differences. It helps people access services, certainly in the UK, probably in the USA. I don't know about elsewhere. Um, if you're a purist, you may say it is an autism. It just looks like it. Um, there are other reasons for it. And you can have that debate. But the problem, I think, is this second thing. And this is really troublesome is that if we start arguing this is not autism, 
do we then deprive people of access to services, autism services that they find very, very helpful? Do we remove a label that people find helpful in understanding behaviours? We could do that and say we will replace that with a syndrome description, but the services are not going to have one service for children with Cornelia Delang, one for Angelman's, one for Prada Willie, one for Soto's, one for Tuberose, and so on, in the way that the autism um, services are organised. So there's, a, there's a, a difficult game to be played around administration versus kind of um, purism uh, around the, the diagnosis. And I'll leave you to debate that over coffee and wrestle with that. But I think there's a, I, th I think what we should have is an awareness that it's not quite autism, but we are happy to use that diagnosis if it is helpful to you. That's the position that I adopt with parents. We may need to refine some of our assessments. When we're looking at eye contact in Angelman's, we may need to be aware of that. There may be other things that we should refine. Um, and then... Does this matter for effective intervention? I think this may be key. So in Cornelia Delang syndrome, it may be, and Rubenstein Toby, it may be that helping people with executive function and attending to the executive function component is more important than an intervention targeted at a core social impairment because we don't believe there is a core social impairment. We believe it's manifest through the EF. So our intervention may be not the sort of intervention that's been done about theory of mind in some of the autism trials. It's more about EF. And similarly, if we have an intervention that targets the social anxiety, that would be different than targeting social indifference. So we want to help someone manage a social situation that they want to be part of rather than um, not wanting to be part of it. And then um, in Birmingham, we're, we're running a trial of um, reciprocal imitation training. So we're teaching an imitation uh, to young children with autism as a key um, construct. But if that's intact in children or not a problem, then that wouldn't be an appropriate intervention. And finally, I just give you that example. And it may be true in Williams syndrome as well, that that strong drive for social motivation alongside poor theory of mind, needs management around social exploitation as opposed to anything else. And the final thing about why this may matter is um, about the profiles of impairment and how they change over time. So I think it, it's often true when I meet with parents of younger children with Cornelia Delang starting to plan out education and the future, that people are assuming greater social independence but actually social independence is very, very problematic for people with Cornelia de Lange. And one of the critical times is the age of 19 when people leave services. Uh, they leave school and go to colleges. And when we track mood in Cornelia de Lange, it's decreasing anyway. Then at age 19, it goes off a cliff. It comes back up around age 22. The reason is, is people are leaving a predictable environment to go into a highly unpredictable world and then uh, services kick in later on. But that tells us that we know if there is a change coming up for someone with Cornelia de Lange, let's start planning now. Early introductions, high predictability, carrying some things over from one environment to the next and so on, getting people prepared. And so there are that generic advice that we may give. So I, I sincerely hope that I've convinced you that this does matter. Otherwise, you probably thought, well, that's been a long 45 minutes to get to this point. There's some of this information on our website. You can see some of our um, social experiments and some of the eye tracking work, some of the documents on autism. And once again, thanks to these guys for, for doing all the work.